My friends, welcome back to the Year of Discipleship. Today, we're going to talk about a really, really fun topic. I know that it's fun when you follow Christ, right? You get the opportunity to partner with Him. You use your mortal hands for His eternal purposes. And one of the best things that we can do with our time here on earth is to share the gospel, to share the good news about Jesus Christ, not to share opinions, not to share new age material or, you know, stare into your belly button hole until you receive a revelation. We're talking about something that's actually going to transform lives. So when I started to learn to, to share the gospel, it was difficult. You know, I, I think just in my personality, I was scared to talk to people. I felt like, I don't know if people are going to want to hear what I have to say. I was scared of what people were going to think of me. Um, and I didn't know how to get a, a crowd of people together to share the gospel. So there were a lot of barriers for me early on in my faith. I didn't know how to share it. I didn't know where to share it. And today I want to alleviate some of those things in your life. I want to help you and teach you how to share the gospel. You know, over the past 12 years, I've been able to sit under so many different teachers and preachers and evangelists. And I've heard every gospel presentation you could probably hear. I probably know all the lines, all the famous one-liners that our, our people that have gone before us, our predecessors sharing the gospel have shared. Um, but I've also been able to sit with some of these people and God has given me that ability. Like I was able to have some personal time with Reinhard Bonnke, the guy who has shared the gospel with more people face to face than anyone else on the planet. So I want to take what I've learned over the last 12 years and synthesize it down into 20 minutes for you. I know this is going to help you. It's going to boost you. And if you stay to the end of this message, you're not going to only hear the best practices for preaching the gospel, but I'm going to actually share the gospel with you. And as I do that, I'm going to teach you certain things that are important to share as you share the gospel. So some of the places that I've been able to share the gospel, I wrote down here are on death row, at kids camps, to local government leaders. I actually saw a high ranking official in a government in a nation receive Christ right in front of me. I've preached the gospel at churches, outdoors in front of crowds of 10,000 people. I even preached at a Muslim wedding hall in Pakistan with 2,000 Muslims blankly staring at me. And I was like, this might be my last day. I've preached one-on-one -on -one in people's homes, just sharing the gospel, like, uh, you know, over a table or across from someone through social media, messaging people. I've passed out tracts and printed materials. I've written books and every book I write, I add the gospel in there. And when Jordan and I were actually traveling to all these countries to get the videos that we share with you, we even airdrop people in crowded train stations, the gospel. We, we would write... Jesus loves you. And we turned on our airdrop and we would send it to people uh, close to us in these crowded places. Um, so before we talk about how to necessarily share the gospel, I want to share five best practices with you. There's five things that you need to know. And these were the most important things that I could think of to share with you today. So if you get started and you're standing on my shoulders, you're going to be able to preach the gospel better than I have been able to preach the gospel. And you'll be able to go farther than Jordan and I have. And that's our goal. We want to elevate you. We want to prepare you. We want to equip you so that you can do this on your own. You're not you're not relying on a pastor. You're not relying on a human. You're not relying on us. You're relying on Jesus Christ himself. We want to share some of those best practices that will get you there. So number one, the first thing that I've learned over preaching the gospel of 12 years in 42 countries, people want and need Jesus. People want and need Jesus. You know, you just have to get over the fear that people don't want Jesus. I can't tell you the amount of times where I've been at a at a party and someone asked me what I what I do and some pastors don't like to say well I'm a pastor or a preacher I love telling people because the first time I was scared to tell someone what I did they said that's amazing that is so cool and they asked me questions you know people actually need Jesus and they want to know Jesus and when you share the gospel in any crowd or any group of people you can know a couple things are true of the people that are in that group. Number one, some people in that group are filled with guilt, right? People are filled with guilt. Maybe they recently had an abortion and they're just filled with shame about what happened with the baby. Maybe people had a divorce and they feel like they fail, failed their marriage and they walked out of their marriage when they could have fixed it. 
Some people feel guilty about things that they've done five, 10, 15 years ago. So whenever you go into a crowd of people or you're talking to a group of people, you can know 100% that someone in that group is dealing with guilt. You also can know that someone in that group, multiple people have a fear of death, right? We all at some point in our lives have feared death. But as Christians, we know what happens to us after we die. Sure, there's a lot of unknowns, right? We haven't gone on to the other side to see what's there, but we have a strong faith and we know that God is faithful to bring us into the afterlife, into eternity. But a lot of people uh, feel like they're afraid of death. In fact, recently there was a study on what type of music young people were listening to. What was the first kind of topic in all these rock songs? It was sex. (laughs) What was the next thing? Death. People talk about death and because it's, it's something that we all are going to have to face at one point in our life. You know, another thing that people struggle with is they feel empty on the inside. They've been trying to fill their lives with everything except for God. And because of that, they have a hole in their heart, a God shaped hole that only God can fill. They've been chasing business. They've been chasing relationships. They've been chasing money, but they still don't have the satisfaction that they're looking for. And finally, in this group of people, there's a there's a, a, a person in there that wants to commit their life to something worthwhile. Up until this point, when you're preaching into that crowd, you can know someone is there wanting to follow Christ. They just don't know that that's what they need. A lot of the times we can't communicate the things that we need. We just know that we have a need. It's like a baby. A baby's hungry, it starts crying. When it needs to go to the bathroom, it starts crying. Many people today are crying out because they need to commit to something. They want their life to have meaning. And what these things do is they actually help as we share the gospel. These needs that people have are actually gonna work for us when we're trying to share Jesus with them and build a bridge that Jesus can walk to. Not only that, but you can know that the Holy Spirit is at work when you share. So number one tip is people want and need Jesus. So just dismantle the lie that people don't want or need Jesus, they do, okay? Don't worry about what they think, just be obedient and follow God. Number two, preach the truth and God will anoint it. Preach the truth and God will anoint it. One of the funny things that Reinhard Bonnke told me when I asked what what is your greatest piece of advice, here's what he told me. He said, God isn't entitled to anoint your opinion. He only anoints the truth. <laughs> so what happens is we, we don't share the truth because we're scared, right? You're, you know, you don't know what they're thinking about you and you try to water it down and you try to stay relevant. Um, and, and you know, you need to fear God and simply share his words. You don't have to worry about what other people think or what they're saying or anything like that. You just have to be faithful to do what God asks you to do. So seek to be truthful, not relevant. Sometimes we try to be so relevant and so open-minded that our brains fall out. You know, some people say, well, Christians are so narrow-minded. No, we just follow the narrow road. So when you're preaching, call sin, sin. Call hell, hell. Call the blood, the blood. Don't worry about what people are gonna think. Preach the truth and know that God will anoint it. You don't have to cater to their insecurity. If they're going through something right now, the Holy Spirit will help you as you preach. You know, one of the things that God told me when I started preaching, I was about three years into my journey. I felt like, are my words even making a difference? When I'm sharing the truth, what's going on? And God said, every time you speak, I'm anointing the truth. And I want to encourage you with that today. Speak the truth and God will anoint it. What's the third of five best practices for you? Make the message title a question your audience wants answered. (laughs) If you want to attract people to hear the gospel, whether that's in a post online or in a big group setting outdoors, you want to have a catchy title. And it's got to be something that matters to your audience because your audience is going to give you their time, their precious time, and you want to be faithful with using that. But you also need their attention. So you have to find ways to grab their attention. One of the easiest ways to do this is by titling your message based on one of the needs that they have or one of the questions that they want answered. For instance, you can, you can call your message, do you know for sure that you'll go to heaven when you die? How to know that you know that you're saved? How about four things you need to do to get to heaven? Or how about how much good must I do to get into heaven? These are all questions that people want the answers to. They're like, well, I did this good, but I did this bad. Like, 
what is it? it? Does Jesus need good works or is it all by faith? Or how does this whole thing work? Or how about why did Jesus have to die? Or even a better question, if God is a loving God, why does he send people to hell? <laughs> Can you imagine telling people that you're going to talk about that? Why Jesus, why, if he's a loving God, why does God send people to hell? Everyone is going to come to that meeting because that's the question that they've all been wondering. They want to know, is this Jesus a loving God or not? Was he truly the savior of the world or was he a fraud? People want to know these things. And when we are preaching the gospel, we're trying to take the truth and make it the medicine for people. We're trying to take away and dismantle false assumptions and replace it with truth, which leads me to the fourth best practice. Answer people's questions and dismantle their false beliefs. Answer their question and dismantle their false beliefs. You know, we talked about some of those questions, but some more is, you know, why did God flood the earth? Why did my mom die of cancer when I prayed? Why would a good God who's loving send people to hell? People have an inaccurate view of God. So everybody knows the word God. God can mean anything. God doesn't specifically mean Yahweh, the God of the Bible. It just means God. It could be the Indian God, the Hindu God, the Buddha, the Buddha um, you know, all sorts of gods. But when we talk about, when we talk about God, we need to make sure that they know who we're talking about. So they have these false assumptions and in their head, they have this picture of what God is like. They say, God is an angry God, or God is an unloving God, or God isn't a God that's going to help me. And so what they, what we're going to do is we're going to try to uh, share who he really is and take away some of their false beliefs. Think about what happened in the Bible with Eve. Think what happened uh, in the Bible with Eve. When Eve was in the garden and God said, don't eat from that tree, who was quick to follow to say, God's holding out on you. If you eat that tree, you're going to be just like God and he doesn't want that. It was the enemy. So the enemy is prowling around like a roaring lion. And what he's doing is he's devouring people. And the way he's doing it is changing their view of God. So what we need to do is give people an accurate view of God. So dismantle some of those false beliefs and assumptions that they have and answer their questions in your message. So here's an example. So why does God send people to hell if he's loving? You know, you might pick that and you say, you know, in your message, you could say a lot of people have this question of if God is so loving, why would he send anyone to hell? And then you can start to put the truth in. You could say God doesn't send people to hell. In fact, God created the universe perfectly but man is the one that sinned and it spread. And so now it's like we're on the Titanic and we're sinking. But picture this. What if someone on the Titanic came to you and said, I have a, a life raft for you and you can choose to use this rif- life raft or not. And you say, I don't need the life raft. Who sent you to your death? It was you, right? Because you chose not to take the life raft. It's the same way with Jesus Christ. He came to die for you so that you would have the option of not going to hell. He actually came on a rescue mission. So God doesn't send people to hell. Do you see how that helps? When you start to dismantle the false beliefs, they start to trust you and they say, okay, this guy knows what he's talking about. or This girl knows what they're talking about. So you want to be able to do that. The second thing, or the fifth, sorry, the fifth, so many numbers today. The fifth thing, uh, the best practice I want to share with you is this. Have two engaging messages ready to give have two engaging messages ready to give. You need to be prepared at all time to have an answer for your faith. The Bible tells us to do that. The Bible says, be ready in and out of season to share the hope that you have with others. So if someone comes to you and they say, well, why do you believe what you believe or what is the gospel? Would you be able to share with them in 60 seconds what the gospel is? Would you be able to? I know that I am. Are you? That's our big question today. We want to equip you to be able to know how to share the gospel, how to share it truthfully, how to share it in, like in an engaging way. And also, if you have to, to share it quickly, like in an elevator or if someone's dying, right? Um, recently, we had someone in the family die. And those are the moments where you don't know where they're going. You don't know what decision they've made. And you might have only a couple seconds to share the good news of Jesus Christ with them. So it's really important. So there's two different messages that I want you to create. The first message is an engaging story message. The second one is kind of like a four ways or a four points on how to message. So the first one 
is going to be using imagery. So you're going to take a Bible story. So let's, for example, let's take John chapter eight, the woman caught in adultery. You're going to use that story and you're going to talk. This is the first message we're talking about. And you're going to say, Jesus was sitting down with his disciples under a beautiful lush tree. And these people were so engaged with Jesus. And all of a sudden, out of the back left corner, there was a swirling dust storm. And there was loud noises of men yelling. And as this group came closer, they saw that these men were dragging a half naked woman and they threw her down at Jesus's feet. Do you see how you're engaged with that story? You're making the story come to life. So with the woman caught in adultery, what, where's the gospel message? There was a woman who sinned. She was caught in adultery. She was brought to Jesus. And then these men started to accuse the woman. They said, We need to stone this woman. The Bible says that if she sinned and she was committing adultery, you have to stone her. What do you say? And then this is where you interject the kindness and the compassion and the forgiveness of Jesus. And you say that when Jesus was there, the woman looked, finally looked up and looked at Jesus in the eyes. And for the first time, she saw pure, sinless eyes. Think of this woman. She was a woman that was caught in adultery. The only thing she knew before this was men who wanted something from her. And when she looked in their eyes, they wanted to see this kind of compassion. But Jesus Christ was the only one that had that compassion for her. And as they locked eyes, it's like their, the doors of their hearts opened up and rivers of love were flowing back and forth. And finally, Jesus said, you who is without sin, cast the first stone. And what happened? All the Pharisees picked up their shorts and started moving in reverse. These men backed up and finally Jesus was alone with the woman. What is that moment? That's the moment of salvation. What did Jesus say? He said, I don't condemn you. He said, where are your accusers? No one was there. Jesus was fighting for the woman. And even though Jesus could have, he was the only person that could have picked up the stone and thrown it at her head. He decided instead that he was going to take the cross and go to the hill and die for her sins in her place. Is that a gospel message? Absolutely. So when you're sharing this kind of a message, you can then talk about how the Pharisees, instead of bowing down and accepting Christ, they ran away because of their pride. And you can engage the audience and you can say, you know, the woman was caught in adultery. And maybe today you're thinking, I am not an adulterer. I didn't kill anybody. I haven't done anything major. And then you can start to share at that moment that we need God's full forgiveness for even the smallest sin. And you can start to share Bible verses that say, if you break one law, you break all the laws. Do you see how we're doing that? What we're doing is we're casting a wide net for people to bring them into Christ. We're saying, it, you know, forgiveness and salvation isn't only for murderers, it's for all of us because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And Jesus died for us. Instead of stoning the woman, what did Jesus do? He went to Calvary to die for her. Isn't that beautiful? And that's what Jesus wants to do for every one of us, including you today. So if today you're tuned in and you haven't given your life to Jesus, this is your moment to be on your knees in front of your Savior who wants to save you, who wants to give you eternal life and forgive your sins. So this is what kind of a message we want to preach. You want to have one dynamic message where you talk about Jesus's characteristics. You talk about someone who was caught in sin and how Jesus forgave them and how he told all of the accusers to back away. And he said, get up and go and sin no more. And he pushed her along the journey and said, you know what? I'm going to give you a second chance. See how that works? So you want to have one dynamic message. And then finally, what you want to have is one point message. So you're going to be preaching to a, a dynamic group of people. You're going to preach to people who want the emotional message. They want to actually see Jesus. And by telling a story through the Bible, you can do that. The second way is a point message. So I want to share those points with you really quickly so that you have them. These are the four points that I have personally come up with after 12 years of preaching the gospel. There are so many ways. There's a six point message on the gospel. You can go down Romans road where you go to Romans 3:23, Romans 6:23, Romans 8, Romans 10, 9 through 10, and you go down Romans road. But sometimes, you know, someone doesn't have time to open a Bible with you. And then, you know, you're flipping pages saying, well, where's Romans road? You know, it's like sometimes you get off the path of, of the Romans road. So here's an easy way to remember. Okay. So I'm going to give you the four steps. The first step is I admit that I'm a sinner. This is the beginning part of sharing the gospel. And if you do not drive this point home, 
you've already lost everybody. They're going to walk away thinking that they don't need forgiveness. But how many of you know that God says in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You're never going to make a change in your life until you feel the pain. It's the same thing as what happened to me about three months ago when I stepped on a scale and I realized that I was getting a little bit bigger. I was like, all right, it's time for some more salads. But until you face the truth, you're not going to change. And people that you're sharing uh, with aren't going to change. So when you, it's, when you talk about people admitting that they're a sinner, you want to share Romans 3.23 with them. And then another one that I like to do is I like to share 1 John 1.8. And it says, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So what I'll do in a group is I'll say, if you have no sin, if someone here today came and they have no sin, go ahead and stand up so everybody can wa- look at you. <laughs> and nobody, I can guarantee you, nobody's going to stand up. But just in case they do, you can read them this verse and say, sit down. <laughs> People are going to think that they're going to see that you have authority when you're preaching this. But all you're doing is sharing the truth with people. You're saying, hey, this is God's way. Another analogy that I like to use is eggs. So a lot of people think that they've done a lot of bad and that they can counteract it with doing enough good to cancel out the bad and they don't need God. One of my cousins one time, I was at the beach with him and I was sharing the gospel with him. And he said, well, I don't believe in all that stuff. I think that you just have to be a good person. (laughs) I laughed so hard. I said, okay, so are you going to start your own church? Are you going to say, is this called good person church, where you can cover up all your bad with enough good? See, Jesus is perfectly holy and perfectly loving. So what does that mean? Every sin needs to be accounted for and brought to justice, but also God has given us forgiveness. So to kind of discount people when they do something wrong actually isn't loving. If someone murders my my dad, I'm going to seek justice for that because that's wrong. It's not a bad thing to seek justice. In fact, God seeks justice. That's why he says to love justice, love mercy, and walk humbly. So in this stage, I like to share what I call the egg analogy. This is for people who say, um, I I do enough good, I don't need Jesus. So I say, okay, so say you're making an omelet and you put in, uh, you know, you put in a bad egg. You open up an egg and you put it in and it's black. (laughs) You open it up and it's a black egg and it's full of disgusting mold and slime. And then to fix it, You decide, well, if I put in four good eggs, that's going to fix the problem. No, it's not. What's going to happen is the bad egg is going to contaminate all the good eggs. And you're not, I don't know anyone who would eat a rotten egg, you know, voluntarily at least. But that's what you share with them. You say, hey, just because you do a lot of good for one bad thing you did, it doesn't make the whole thing okay. You actually need God's forgiveness for the whole thing. So cast a wide net for people. Show them that they need complete salvation for even the smallest sins. I like to share an analogy as well. So after I share those two verses and the egg analogy, I will then go to the 70 year old analogy. And I use this all the time. I say, so imagine there's a 70 year old person who's lived uh, an amazing exemplary life. And they, they followed God's rules to a T. They never broke a rule. They never looked at a woman with lust. They never lied. They've never cheated. They never stole. They never did anything. And on his, the first day of his 71st year of life, he committed a sin. What happens with him? Well, if you break one commandment, you're guilty of all the commandments in God's sight. Why? Because we can't attain perfection without perfection himself, Jesus Christ. God isn't going to let you take the glory. (laughs) He knows we're all messed up. So what I like to say is I like to share James 2.10 with people. I say, for whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking it all. So at this point, you have your audience feeling their sin that you are confronting them with their sin. You're saying, this is the problem. Not Jesus isn't the problem. Sin is the problem. And you're attacking the sin. So now you have their attention. They're saying, well, shoot. Now I remember all the bad stuff I did. And now I realize I can't add, uh, you know, five eggs to the bad, bad egg. The second step that you share with them out of the four points is I realize I can't fix myself. That's my favorite. It's one of my favorite things to say. You can't fix yourself. In fact, only God can fix the sin problem in your life. We can't do enough good to to make up for all the bad things that we've done. And I like to talk about Paul. I say Paul was a man 
that wrote two thirds of the New Testament, right? So Paul is like a super Christian. His lineage was perfect. His background was perfect. Um, his conversion story was the most radical conversion story in in human history, and he was the most like close follower of Christ. We'd say like Paul was a really good follower of Christ, but Paul had one problem that we have today, and that's that he couldn't fix himself. He couldn't fix his sin problem. In fact, in Romans 7, he he constantly says, "I do the thing. Why do I do the thing that I hate? And why can't I do the right thing that I want to do? Oh, wretched man that I am! Who will fix me from this body of sin?" And then guess who he points to? He points to Jesus Christ. That brings you to your next point. I humbly receive the good news. This is the third step. I humbly receive the good news. What is the good news? It's the best news in the world. It's that Jesus came and died for you, just like that woman caught in adultery. She was guilty and full of shame, and even when she was on her knees, she probably looked up at Jesus and said, "You know what? I- I'm okay if this man kills me because he's perfectly holy. I just don't want those lousy Pharisees to do it." Because she knew she was guilty. She was laid bare in front of Jesus. But the good news is that Jesus came and died on the cross for us. What he did was essentially a rescue mission to take away our sin and to make us right with his Father in heaven, so that we could be justified through faith, through grace. That's it. It's a free gift. God gives it to us. We can say we will receive it or not receive it, and then whatever we choose is is on us because we've had to make that choice. So when we talk about the good news, you want to talk about the cross. You want to talk about the blood. You want to say the name Jesus Christ. If you're giving a gospel message and you're not saying Jesus Christ, something really wrong there. Jesus is the focus of everything that we're doing. I usually point people to one of the most famous verses in the Bible. At this point, I'll talk about John three sixteen through seventeen, and it says, "For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whosoever believes in Him may not perish." But have eternal life. You know why this verse is so powerful? Because number one, it talks about God loving the world. It means that God loves the world. He loves you. He had a plan for your life. He he's crazy about you. And not only that, but he gave his most prized possession in for you. Like he redeemed your life with the with the best thing that he had, which was his own son. I don't think anyone else would ever sacrifice their child for someone else that they didn't know. That's what God did. He basically said, "I'm going to give my son for you, and whoever believes in him may not perish but have eternal life." My friends, is there anything better? Is there any better offer in the world than eternal life? Is there anything better? And it, it's that it doesn't even cost you anything. <laughs> so when you're sharing the good news, you're saying this is a free gift. Your sins can be forgiven. You can have a purpose for living. You can have a home in heaven. It's like the greatest news we could ever share. So when we're sharing the gospel, we should be smiling about it. We shouldn't be solemn and and pretend like Jesus is still dead on a cross, like some churches, you know, put it. It's like you go to a church and you see a picture of Jesus on a cross, and that's in front of their whole chapel. And I'm thinking he's not on the cross anymore, my friend. So. You have to realize this is the best news, and so people have to humbly receive this. This is the only way into the kingdom. The only way into the kingdom of God is on your knees. That's the only way on the kingdom. It's to go to the altar and say, "I confess, Jesus Christ, I give you my life." So Jesus came to die for you, to take your sins to the cross, so you can be made right with God. Like I said, have a brand new start, a purpose for living in a home in heaven. And another cool verse that I like to share after this is First John one nine. And it says this: If we confess our sins, because people wonder, if I give my life to Christ, does He forgive me, or is He going to bring that stuff back up again? Like if you have a if you have a ex girlfriend or you have an ex boyfriend, they're really good at telling you all the things that you did bad.、Um, they might say like, "Oh, I totally forgive you," but th- they they haven't. Jesus isn't like that. Jesus actually forgives your sin the moment you confess it, and He won't bring it up ever again. He He separates us as far as the east is from the west. It's like He puts it on an anchor and drops it to the ocean to be seen no more. It says, "We if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from some unrighteousness. No, all unrighteousness. I want to see if you're paying attention. He will He will purify us from all unrighteousness. So I like to tell people when I'm sharing the gospel." It's like taking a spiritual shower. You have all this stuff on you. You've been rolling in the dirt of sin. You have all this stuff all over your body. But then you step into this shower, and as the water comes down, it pulls all the dirt off, and it goes down into the drain, and you're not able to see it again. 
That's what God's forgiveness is like. And finally, the fourth step in sharing this type of a gospel message is I pray to be forgiven for my sins and to receive eternal life. Acts 16, 31 says, they replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Wow, that's a huge qualification. I thought, you know, early in my life, I thought you had to do like 50 things to get saved. Here it says, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. That's unbelievable. You have to just believe in what Jesus did. Romans 10, 9 through 10, I love this verse. It says, if you declare with your mouth, this is how, you're, this is how you get saved. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. There it is, plain and simple. You want to know how to be saved? It's right there. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. You know, Ephesians 2, 8 is another good one. It says, for it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves, but it is a gift of God. So my friends, if you want to share the gospel, you have to walk them through those steps. You have to first have people acknowledge that they're a sinner. Then you have to have them realize they can't fix themselves. Then they have to receive the good news, which is great news, right? We talked about that humbly on their knees. And then you pray to get saved and have your sins forgiven. Um, So either one of those steps is totally fine. If you want to do the story, the story, or if you want to do the steps, that's totally fine. But what I would recommend for you on how to preach the gospel is to have both ready. You can use my example um, in, in the woman caught in adultery. And I think later on, we'll even do another series on how to preach the gospel more Um, you know, in depth, but for now, here's the, um, you know, 20,000 foot version of it. So realize that people need Jesus and they want Jesus. Know that people that are listening to you share are engaged. Um, Make it, make it appealing for them in the way that you craft your message um, and you title your message. And then also remember to dismantle some of their false beliefs and trade it with the truth. People don't know who God really is until someone says it, right? That's what the Bible talks about. How are they going to know unless someone tells them? And finally, the last thing that I told you to do is have those two encouraging messages. If you have two messages prepared at all times, you're able to share. And finally, I want you this week to come up with a 30-second gospel presentation. That's right, a 30-second gospel presentation. You could say, God created the earth and it was perfect, but man decided to fall away from God and his heart became corrupt. He was full of sin. And at one point, man received, he understood that he couldn't fix himself. He was, in a, he was in a hole that he couldn't get out of. And finally, Jesus came down because his father sent him to earth to forgive his people and bring them back to him. And he said that you don't have to do a lot of good works. All you have to do is believe in me and confess with your heart and you'll be saved and you'll have eternal life, a new purpose to live for and a home in heaven. There it is. That's like 25 seconds. You can share the gospel so quickly and concisely with people that they will be so impacted by you. So my friends, go out and share the gospel. I want you to create those two messages in the 30-second message, and you will be equipped to share your faith with anyone. God bless.